Uh, firstly, I'll just echo the sentiments and views of my fellow commissioners uh, to say thanks to all those who've been involved, gave evidence and provided support to the Commission. It's been a fantastic opportunity. I'm going to take you through Chapter 5 uh, of our report, which is about revitalising local democracy, representation and accountability. There were five key areas of focus and they're contained with recommendations 16 to 19. The first of that was around the model of political leadership, decision making, and we believe that should be a matter for local choice. If I'd been a politician, I'd probably give the answer, I'll just refer you to the answer previously given by my learned colleague, Councillor and Lord Gary Porter. Um, local government's at the front line of our democracy. More people trust their council and councillors than do government or ministers, and we saw evidence of that. We heard evidence with strong views in favour of particular models. Interestingly, many elected mayors favour the elected mayor model. <laughs> many favour smaller, larger, single tiers, multi tiers, and so on. But what there was a clear consensus throughout our work was that this should be locally determined. It should not be imposed and should not be financially incentivised. So when we refer to decisions made as recently as yesterday on local government reorganisation, yes, those proposals have build, been built up locally, but the decisions have been made and determined nationally, centrally. The second of those areas was that councillors are under pressure. The image of the local councillor needs to improve and the pool standing for election broadened. Now the context of this, as you all know, 15 years of austerity, more demands from casework and casework that's much more complex than previously. The cabinet model has disillusioned many backbenchers who feel marginalised and we heard that. Party political structures, decision making, transparency, the role of the party whip can sometimes cause difficulties and compromise local councillors. The inability to control and influence very important local issues, GPs access, highways issues and so on puts local councillors in very difficult positions. And the increasing abuse of local authority members through and on social media is nothing short of a disgrace. Now, put that together through a particular window, being a local councillor ain't a particularly attractive option to many. But what we did here was real passion, commitment and belief in the need to improve local areas and the, likelihood, the outcomes for local people. And we heard some superb examples of the role of a 21st century councillor, that of a community champion with delegated <coughs> budgets making a real difference in local areas. And some examples in places like Durham where this is advanced. But still, it had limitations. We also heard lots of evidence supporting the need for the pool of people standing to be uh, councillors to be more representative and broadened particularly among younger people, minority groups, women and people with disabilities. We also heard and had good discussion about the whole image of local government and really reflected how wonderful it would be if we shared and enjoyed a similar national profile to that of the NHS. Now on the back of COVID and COVID recovery and the amazing work being done throughout this country at a local level, driven and led by local councils, there's a moment in time to put that right, to really showcase what it is that local government does to make an enormous difference and why it's so invaluable as the bedrock of our local democracy. The third area was that the demographic profile of councillors needs more diversity and the barriers to standing as a councillor need to be removed. We know that the average councillor is white, old and male. We know that the percentage of women councillors is as low as 35% in England, 29% in Scotland and 33% in Wales. And only 7% of councillors are from the ethnic minorities. It's similarly underrepresented in those with disabilities. Now we saw and heard some excellent and commendable examples of work to improve this. But generally it's too little and too slow. And we heard of a whole range of barriers that limit people's ability to stand. The lack of a proper scheme of remuneration and pensionable pay, the lack of adequate childcare, the increasing demands on people with caring responsibilities and the inability to balance that with their responsibilities as local councillors. All this issues such as times and dates and venues of meetings, and again the party political systems for selection are often prohibitive. 
When we heard that only 4% of councils have formal maternity and paternity leave policy for councillors, it puts it into context. Four in 10 women councillors experience sexist behaviour within their own party or from fellow councillors. And some of the Fawcett Society evidence they heard was nothing short of alarming. Now my summary of that, I would refer to a quote from one of my fellow commissioners, Heather, who in one of the sessions, and I thought at the time she was visibly, clearly upset and steam rising, simply said, it's quite frankly not good enough. And she's right. The fourth area to cover was that institutional complexity and churn, notably in England, has confused accountability. And since the 1990s, our local democratic architecture is much more complex. Now, it's far less so in Wales, and I've recently spent time with colleagues from local government in Wales, and I was so heartened to hear of so many improvements that have been made genuine collaboration, better relationships with their devolved government, making real, much better differences to their local areas. And we've seen similar in Scotland and Northern Ireland where we've seen a, a, a greater clarity uh, of structural change to councils. But in England, it does remain much of a patchwork quilt. We've seen council mergers, we've seen combined authorities. They're often overlapped by police and crime commissioners, fire authorities, local enterprise partnerships, NHS providers, integrated care partnerships, regional skills commissioners, and I could go on and on. Many of those, of course, with differing geographical boundaries. The summary of that was a quote we heard at our commission from a member from the Conservative Councillor Association who said, nobody knows who runs things. There's a colleague here today who's from a place called Nunthorpe in Middlesbrough. He, over the last 18 months, has, if he took part in the elections, voted for a parish councillor, a ward councillor, an elected mayor of Middlesbrough, an elected mayor of Tees Valley, a police and crime commissioner, and an MP. If his child couldn't get an appointment at the GP, I don't know really who's going to go and see. I'd refer to a quote from a 91-year-old year father, actually, and he didn't give evidence to the commission, but he gave it to me. He said, never go in an aeroplane when it's got more than two pilots. <laughs> I'll leave my last comment from this section to a quote that came at a wonderful piece of work, actually. It was by the British Youth Council at their North East Conference, and Elmer Murray referred to it. It was a, a great last by the name of, of Alicia. And she looked at this conference where they debated the future of local government and the work of this commission, and she just said, why does it have to be so complicated? Quite. The fifth area that this section covers was calls for councils to be recognised as the democratic anchor for its place and for powers of scrutiny extended to cover all of our public services. Now, this actual recommendation supports the findings of the Communities and Local Government Select Committee findings in their 2017 report. And we heard lots of evidence born out of frustration. So much that impacts on local places and on local people, for which actually the council is no longer the local authority. If we think of Homes England, the Arts Council, Network Rick, CCGs and so on, Accountability for them is so often hit, hidden in a structural maze. And some of the most memorable evidence that we got, I think from the National Town, uh, Town Planning Council, governed around why isn't Rotherham Freeburg? And it's because it doesn't control all that it needs to to make changes needed at a local level. Councillor Sharon Taylor from Stevenage, the leader there, advocated local public accounts committees with formal powers and our commission were quite taken by this as a means to improve the scenario. Critically, if we don't correct it, we risk further disconnect between local government and its communities and that further supports why be a councillor, why vote if we can't make sense of it all. So those recommendations are cleared at 16, 17, 18 and 19 and I'll leave you to see them in the reports. <laughs>